Hello, good people, and welcome back to another episode of our Rome Recap series. Now, if you've been tuning in to our previous recordings, you would know that we tend to talk about notes and thoughts we had during the previous week. Well, now we're going to change things up a bit. Instead of talking about multiple different things, we are going to base the episode around one main topic, and we are going to do this by reviewing the Oxford Very Short Introduction books. Now, if you haven't heard of them, go and check them out. They are amazing and give you a real insight into practically any topic you can think of. I think there are around 630 of them as we speak, and I would assume they bring out new ones every year. So if you ever feel like you need to dive into a subject, these books are perfect. Now, today we are reviewing a very short introduction to philosophy, which is kind of ironic when you think that philosophy is such a big subject that it can barely fit into an hour and a half long podcast, let alone 100 pages but we've done our best. We explore the three main questions posed in the book, such as what should we do, how do we know, and what am I? Each of these questions have been tackled by many famous philosophers, and so we touch on their work as well throughout the recording. We also explore a lot of the isms, and there are so many of them, such as materialism, idealism, dualism, rationalism, empiricism, skepticism, and more. And now I know what you're thinking, This all sounds rather daunting, and I'm not going to lie, it can be. But each of these concepts can give a whole new way of looking at the world, and with that, a lot more depth. So do brave it with us, and if you enjoy it, do let us know by leaving a like, a comment, letting us know what you thought, and subscribing to our channel so you can be made aware when we next bring out another episode. I think the next Rome recap will be the philosophy of science, thus following on with this philosophical theme. But until then, I hope you enjoy the very short introduction to philosophy. very short introduction well it's going to be short hopefully to uh philosophy um so yeah like you said it's quite broad but i think that was the whole point of it the whole idea is he the guy who wrote i can't remember who wrote it uh yes it's edward craig the bloke edward craig yeah so he tries to avoid pigeonholing slash boxing philosophy into something that you can really define um I got this from the introduction that is he was talking about this idea that we, you know, we're all makeshift philosophers in our own sense, because we all have our own answers to the sort of two um, fundamental questions, which is like, what should we do and what there is. So he talks about how philosophy is the sort of inquiry to try and answer those questions. Um, And a really important thing I got from it was he said something like this, which is philosophy isn't about, you know, establishing facts or establishing information that you can add yeah. to your worldview. It's more of like a um, a set of values and yeah. worldview, which I thought was quite interesting because um, a lot of his ideas around sort of the philosophy of metaphysics, yeah. let's just say, so what's after physics is around about, you know, is the world made out of things or is it made out of the yeah. idea of things? Um, so, yeah, it was being... Because he, he was like, yeah, philosophy is an incredibly broad term that covers multiple areas. And it's quite interesting if you think about it because... The origins of philosophy, right, in my in my mind at least, are is the inquiry into, you know, yeah. the world yeah. and the universe into trying to understand what everything is. And you can almost argue that philosophy has evolved into very specific mm. disciplines in yeah. academia. So like philosophy started off with, you know, these questions like what should we do? So um, you know, yeah. how to act, how do we know, which is epistemology, and then sort of what there is or what is after physics, which is what yeah. metaphysics stands for. Um, but then you think about it over time, these inquiries have sort of solidified. So for example, metaphysics is actually technically become physics in the sense that if you do believe of the concept of materials yeah. existing, then you start going that direction. That, yeah. Then you do. Right. So it's like this idea that philosophy started the inquiry. And I think I took a side note of, um, Bertrand Russell, cause he tried to define it. He said he, he defines philosophy as something between theology yeah. and science. Um, because it obviously has led to science, but at the same time, there is a level of, oh, what's the, I was going to say, it's hard to explain, but like assumptiveness underneath yeah. the philosophy yeah. itself, um, which cannot still be proven. So in the sense of physics, right? I mean, we've yeah. spoke about this before, yeah. haven't we, Tristan? We're like the idea that do, like we think that particles and 
you know physical things exist because obviously it, intuitively it makes sense but actually the concepts we use to describe them such as atoms and electrons are just concepts we've created to explain yeah. phenomena rather than actually being visible yeah. and seen so for example like one of the ways of testing to see if an atom is real is the idea of like a like an atom, atomic yeah. bomb right because because we predict that our model where you collide two atoms and explode or whatever um, that's that's how we think it would react if that concept of an atom yeah, is correct yeah. and it happens. Therefore, we believe in this idea of an atom, but we haven't ever seen yeah. one. Um, so yeah, I, that was. I don't know if you got anything else from the sort of introduction side of things of, of the book because he d- he did try and yeah keep it very yeah. Clear. I think like you know the three the three main questions that he brings up you know as in what should I do, how do we know, and what I am, what am I, kind of yeah that those are the areas that he kind of jumps into trying to give um uh give material and give people's like accounts so you know um touching on many different philosophers to try and explore those three yeah. different questions because they kind of are trying to encompass the whole okay and like you just said mm-hmm. it's like um you know if you are a physicist and you do believe that the world is made out of the, these material goods how do you prove that? Yeah. And that's one of those ways. And I think basically, you know, the big introduction of what to this is that they're just different ways of thinking about the world and well, everything really, including yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah. you know, if you think about over time, people just look at a problem slightly differently and they're like, what if I do this? You know, yeah. how does that work? does does this link with everything else and so they're kind of like paradigm shifts in themselves you know yeah Um, yeah literally it's it's like like i said it isn't you know like sorry like he said at the beginning it's it's not um a set of facts philosophy isn't facts it's a worldview it's uh it's if this is true then what else can come after this type of thing and you can build a worldview off this basic core assumption or and they build i think like philosophies it builds like a direction to go in And then what you end up having, you have little branches that dart off because some person's more interested in this area and some person's more interested in this area. And depending on their belief system, their conceptual system, why they might think that is a different matter. But, you know, I I, like he also mentions that as let's say someone's more biologically driven, then they might start to think like apply philosophy in that direction. And then you end up having all of these subjects that come off like separate yeah, yeah. from philosophy and like yeah. it, it, you know it, um ian mcgillchrist talks about this and we talked about it but now it's like almost too separate you know as in like people okay. don't don't mix the two they don't apply philosophy to these other subjects as much and so if philosophy is the direction and you don't have that direction mm-hmm. anymore then you're kind of going any which way well yeah like philosophy in a weird way as well i see it as like the is like the ultimate tool for humility and your own knowledge because it's inquiring about how you yeah. know things, for example. Like, you know, even even the how we should act is almost still linked to this idea of how do we know yeah. how we should act. Like all of it's the, in my head, it's the same. How do I know who yeah. I am? It's like it's almost like a, the ultimate humility based uh, sort of experiment you could do with yourself, which is sort of ask yourself these basic questions. Um, yeah, and I, I think well, like, you know, like you go back to your point about um, uh, philosophy is basically in between theology and science. Cause I was contemplating that while reading this book, I was like, well, how is this slightly different from religion? But it kind of takes religious well, aspects yeah. and points it in a certain direction, yeah. you know? Well, and then science gets yeah. closer well, and further along. That. I was almost, yeah. I mean, re- weirdly from reading the philosophy of science, which I think we will yeah. go on to either in a couple of weeks, but um, it kind of, makes you really realize even these scientific improvements back to what i just said about the concept of atoms and how you know it's still a theory concept rather Mm. than real it just helps us predict things therefore you know at some point in the future it can be rewritten or rethought or whatever and once again then it technically does go into the realm of religion in the sense of we believe in the concept without i guess with this in general it has more of a Expl- explanatory effect in terms of it helps you explain yeah. things but then that's what yeah, religion yeah. started off as and it gets refined over time but the point being is you know even science in itself has become a kind of pseudo religion of like progress yeah. like back to the seven types of atheism one of the book was called and it, yeah it argues that you know science itself is you know fine uh, off, off kind of off topic but on topic the idea that science can give you 
what you should do and values. How yeah. do you determine? How do you determine what to do with using yeah. science? You know, well, I th- those scientific way to make decisions, right? And they talked about this in and what's the Robert Damasio's book, the emotion, uh, uh, Descartes', Descartes era, yeah. which is like. It's like the the idea that if you don't have emotions, you can't actually yeah. make decisions. So people who have that split ba- uh, brain, or they they cut down the yeah, middle, brain surgery, bra- yeah. two sides of the brain can't talk to each other, right? So they don't have the emotion to make decisions. So they can consistently ponder over a decision mm. to make for days and yeah. days and days and days, and never ever make a decision or never ever make and yeah. take an action, right? Because you know there's no scientific way to determine what action to take. It, it's almost emotional, which makes you take the action, and therefore it's like it's in the realm. Is I well, I guess you could then argue looking at emotions what the science of how emotions make yeah. you act in a certain way maybe but it's, but, um, it's interesting when you think that like you know for a science um science uses the method of experimenting to find a solution or a result right it's almost like with philosophy that comes with debate that's its method of refining or trying to come up okay. with a certain solution because you you can't there's no omnipotent kind of creature that knows all and they're not going to come down and be like this is how it is you know and so I throughout the book what I really liked is he constantly talked about someone's perspective and someone's approach basically being created by their opponents so okay you know if let's say you put a, a theory forward and someone's like I don't agree with this bit of it you know and then someone goes I don't agree with that bit and so it's constantly being refined through kind of debate and being like applied to the world. And that's what I kind of liked is that you have to have opponents to kind of refine its shape. To re- refine yeah. ideas. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I mean, well, I guess with, with the philosophy based stuff, it's always like the hi- history of philosophy in itself is just like somebody proposes an idea, somebody yeah. builds on it or refutes it and then explains why. And like, if you look, yeah, from across all of these thinkers across time, it's all of them just picking out holes in each other's arguments and saying why they're wrong. But then if you actually do- delve into the actual, like what's the word nitty gritty base assumptions, they all have these similar yeah. base assumptions in a weird way. So like, this is why they have these terms, which we're going to go on to later, like uh, materialism and idealism. Cause like the philosophy is built off these presumptions that, you know, ideas are what matters and there's no such thing as matter. These material things come first and therefore everything is material. Therefore your brain is obviously immaterial and your your reality is made out of material or whatever um but yeah should we yeah. should we move on to the, the second chapter which was what should i do um to, he took a very plato focused yes. um approach to this and there's obviously many more different ways to sort of approach this in general um it, it, basically the the crux of it for what i got was this idea of the what should we do is in the realm of morality which actually is part of a um Morality and ethics, isn't it, is a part of philosophy, which is the classic sort of answers or inquiry into how we should act. Um, and they talked about how Socrates was one of the first people to f- put forward ideas such as do no harm to others. Um, and also, I think I got here, yeah, breaking a fair agreement mm. is wrong. But it's quite interesting how, you know, and the question I always wonder about now is this idea, you know, because Peterson likes to talk about it and also is this idea of like a meta ethic emerging from deep within us or whether we are just following blindly these yeah. philosophers. So this idea of, you know, um, they've said, you know, don't, don't cause harm to others and always honor a f- fair agreement. And you see these rules still in law these days, roughly, yeah. right. You know, don't commit murder, etc. Um, and then you have to ask yourself the question of these built into us or these moral rules that the philosoph- philosophical inquiry back then has been built upon over time to create, you know, our moral landscape yeah. slash, you know, law regulations, etc. Well, I, yeah, I think I think it's um, interesting because, like, if if you take like a evolutionary perspective, you could argue that people are inherently selfish, right? And morals. Mm-hmm are a way of keeping people more as a collective in a sense that they benefit kind of more than just the individual. And I think from this, um, you know, Socrates, uh, this Plato kind of insert that he talks about, I kind of got the feeling that it was talking about Socrates in a sense that everything's kind of connected, whether you are an individual okay you're still connected to the whole, to the, all of society. And, you know, this is talks about him being put on trial and whether he wants to go into exile or whether he, he wants to um, uh, accept his death. Um, and 
all of his kind of justifications for his stance on just staying and uh, you know accepting that he's going to be put to death is based on like were well, based on values, wasn't it? Yeah, his own personal values yeah. of like you know uh, virtue exactly. Almost, right? And because it kind of all links together, he says like you know I'm part of the state. I've been uh, you know it's mm. made me who I am. These are the values that I hold. This is the impact on my kids, on my family, on my friends, everything like that. And so, you know, you're almost, there's always going to be conflict, but it's almost just trying to choose the higher order, like decision in a sense, the one that kind of benefits yeah, the yeah. most. I, I find it quite interesting the whole the whole concept of a like philosoph- philosophical inquiry into how to act is interesting because it is, philosophy in this sense is almost like a value mm. system, isn't it really? Like you said, because when Socrates was on the trial, they were basically, I, I'm never going to get the details correct, but he was being asked to do things to save himself from being executed, basically. And it was stuff like, you know, hand in his accomplices or something like that, or rat out his family, or it was something along those lines, which he obviously yeah. didn't do. Um, and it's this idea of high, the highest virtue is how you act. And then this idea that, you know, there is a correct way yeah. to act, um, which was set back in, back then, like his... I guess him and Plato in general were talking about this. There's, there's a correct way to do yeah. things, right? Which almost you could say brought about this idea of religion over time because they built on those ideas and had ten commandments. Because these days you got the moral relativists acting around and saying, you know, um, there is no absolute laws; everything yeah. is relative to to one another. Which is also, um, I think, they talk about later. Yes, yeah. but um, I, I just found it really fascinating that you know these how we should act almost came about from these these principles espoused years thousands of years ago and obviously like you said with this idea that people were building on each other and i think what is quite interesting like you said is about this idea of trying to marry together the individual as the and the collective and using these inquiries of how to act to benefit the whole without i guess in fact if anything yet probably had socrates in general had a he had an approach that was probably more, uh, not was because he communist, but it's not the right word, socialist, in terms of he put everybody before himself mm. or the community. Um, but I guess that's always been the tension throughout history between the individual and the well, social. And, and and then this is, where I guess, where always the conflict of how we should act has been um, incited or you know come about because there's always this conflict between the individual and the collective and what's right and what's wrong based on the, you know, the marrying of the yeah. two. Um, but yeah, I, d- I don't really know how much more because to be honest, I think he talked actually one thing else that I got from it was the the Kant, uh, Manuel Kant came up with the, you know, the ultimate general rule, which was something along the lines of, let me see here, what would happen if everybody behaved like that? And that was his ultimate moral principle. So like he used like consequentialism, yeah. which is like, you know, if everybody, like what happens as a consequence if everybody did that? And if everybody did that, if that's a bad result, and we all agree on that, then that's yeah. not a good thing to do. And that was his way of like morally deducing what's right and wrong by, you know, if everybody did it, what would the yeah. result be? And I guess and if you said like everybody was murdering and everybody was going around, you know, I don't know, stealing, what would the end result be? And obviously chaos and anarchy, potentially hell. Uh, but, you know, that... I yeah, that because it's, it's basically like a spectrum. or well, that's how I would see it. You know, you've got selfishness at one one end and then... Uh, kind of a moralistic collective at the end uh, at the other and you know it's interesting because I've I've very much been like thinking a lot about morals recently and their kind of direction which they point someone in um and it's hard to say whether you should always you know always stay moral because you know take Jordan Peterson's point for example when he talks about playing um breaking a rule And he talks about Harry Potter and he says that, you know, the benefit, uh, like the reason why Harry Potter is so um, adored by uh, Dumbledore is that he knows when to break a rule. If the following the rule goes against the purpose of the rule, then it, it, then it should be broken. Right. Because there's a higher moral, I I guess, higher moral um, reason. So I guess I, I wonder whether you, you could argue that morals are always required Required well, for just I don't know, like whether there's a context or a situation where, like, like you know, by doing it, you're kind of going against, I don't know, some other moral, or I, I, I don't think, know. But 
it's, it's, it's such a it, my conclusion from this as well was like in this chapter he talks about this idea that you know philosophy, philosophy in general and these general rules have always been trying to take the complex and mm. make it simple by you know producing a general law like a commandment right but then there's always examples or contexts where they might not apply and then they're also in juxtaposition to each other like you know for example that classic, I can you remember that classic one where it's like, do you, there's a train track and it's oh, going to kill yeah, five yeah. people, one person. Which one do you yeah. pick, right? And then you could also change the dynamic. So, okay, the young, so the five people are all old and the other person is young. Yeah. Who do you kill again, right? And there's no general principle that can really answer this apart from you, you sort of have a general principle, such as like, um, maybe, obviously, you don't want people to die. So you've already broken that. So then it's like, okay, right, who do you save? People are going to die anyway in two years or somebody who's young got their whole life ahead of them. And then it's the, the juxtaposition of, do you say five people v one or do you put the one youth yeah. above yeah. the old? Um, and that is something which doesn't apply to, you know, the rules, right? So this is... Exactly. This is where the, the inquiries always end up in... And this is where the world ends up in such a juxtaposition and, like, chaos and everything because there is no easy yeah. answer to any of these There's things. There's not. And, and you um, know, taking this example of this um, chapter, when he's talking about, you know, you've still got a family, you've still got children... And you'd be going against them by, you know, saying that you're uh, you're not going to exile, uh, you're not going to go into exile. And you could even argue the point that, like, if he did go into exile, he could have written a lot more, which would probably prosper all of us now, right? But um, yeah, yeah. but then that would go against, oh, yeah, Socrates, yeah, 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 like moral code. And so it's yeah, like you said, there's never like a right answer. But it's just... it is interesting as well, like back then. So this is like how we should act, right? The, a lot of emphasis was placed on virtue and the correct action, whereas I would argue that was like a very specific time where, like a bit like we talked to before about mm. chivalry and like they talk about chivalry being dead and all this stuff in the modern yeah. age, right? And it's quite interesting because it's there's almost like always like a value battle between like should we you know act correctly or should we just do mm. what we can like the back to the selfish and collective thing. And I think it's quite interesting now because I I would say almost morality and the law have become mixed in one. If something's legal, then it, it you know, it's relatively moral because it's not illegal. Like people do anything and then they'll be like, oh, well, yeah. it's not illegal. But what's, so I tell you what's not, interesting then is yeah. that no kind of moral can be held at the same level as other morals. Like people are going to okay. value some over others. And so yeah. that moral is going to, going to lead the way more than another one let's say someone mm-hmm. cherishes honor more than integrity then they're going to take more of an honor perspective and uh, do you get okay, what yeah. i mean so um, like it's yeah it's, never, it, it's, yeah, it's exactly. a hierarchy right or relatively yeah. this is the this is the yeah and this is the problem with it and to be honest the one thing i think i've got from the, the whole thing was this idea that you know it is all relatively up for debate to a degree but i do also believe i do also side on this idea that not that there's a fixed morality, but that there's a morality that we all deep down kind mm. of get. But then, but then it doesn't explain. Uh, too bad we're sidetracking. We can move on, but it doesn't explain. You know, the people who are out there and actually do harm others, in the sense that they don't feel any. I mean, you read that book about about empathy, yeah. didn't you? But I was just thinking, like, you know, I want to say that we all have this deep seated like mor- moral code, which we all kind of like comes out of us, such as you know treat people equally and you know, treat people with respect relatively but then you've got these people who yeah. don't and then and they don't feel any remorse for it so it's like okay well i can't have that general rule because there's people yeah. out there who break it so then that that backs up this whole the, you know the relativist argument which is like you know morals yeah. are relative and the moment you take that approach and anything well, this, goes, this is it if you witness like... someone cheat you've got two options you either you know tell on him and say that this guy yeah. cheated, or you're made aware that there's a way to cheat, and so you can yeah. cheat. Do you know what I mean? And it's yeah. like the severity changes depending on whether you cheat or not. But it, yeah, I, I kind of makes you aware that there is cultural difference. There's a, there's cultural differences between you know people who like shaft people and others. They talk mm. about corruption and stuff like that. And I guess it's all back to like seeing others doing it and imitating. Um, and like on that point, it's like yeah. you know cultures hold different morals um have a different moral hierarchy basically you know yeah yeah no I'm, what's I'm in their society they, yeah. might not benefit someone else's society um yeah yeah Should yeah we move, on, to, we move yeah. on from there I, yeah i feel like with that one in particular it's like it's 
it's so hard to there's well, no mate, all of these just like all just, of these just, are just yeah yeah well yeah but, um, so the next one was what should i uh sorry no how do we yeah. know and um, this is based on hume's uh miracles yeah i hope i'm kind, pronouncing kind of, his name right otherwise i'm yeah yeah i would pronounce yeah. it hume as well but um i didn't i didn't particularly like this one only because i read a whole one a very short introduction to mm-hmm. knowledge which is obviously more deep into this so this one just like you just basically covered hume um oh, i guess the main thing i got from it was there was a shift when hume came about from you know uh, our status in the universe i don't know if you got that bit so he talked yeah. about like the hierarchy of there was like god humans then down yeah, lower yeah, was animals yeah. and he reimagined us as like gods up here and us just yeah. above animals being like a middle-sized animal i think he used as a term and it's quite interesting because back to like this idea of philosophy as a worldview the moment you stop thinking of humanity and humans as you know up there with the yeah. gods and you start thinking of us as actually just an animal you completely change the the confidence and worldview of us yeah. if that makes sense our place is completely yeah. different therefore we then view the world from a completely separate place so instead of being you know just below gods we're like all, almost demigods each and we you know we've all got purpose and we've all got this to just being like a random you know hairless yeah. ape who happens to have a pretty big brain <laughs> it completely changes you know not just your place but the way yeah. everything is because <clears throat> all of a sudden you're not you're not like um bound by gods and they're you know the the what do you call it, like the, is it teleology where like you have like a specific purpose or function whereas now you're kind of like you're yeah. just an animal <laughs> and i just thought that was uh what? was interesting it's kind itself. of interesting because yeah once you put yourself on that level on the same level as an animal you start to see your behavior is similar to others or cause and effect basically similar to others and so like i think before yeah. prior when you, when you consider yourself up on a god level when something occurs that you can't explain you explain it as a miracle but the further you are away from god and the more you are on like a natural level then you can start yeah. to reason why that occurred and then it's kind of yeah. asking like uh, the big thing that i got from from this um chapter and about hume is that the probability of something happening whether that's yeah. nature yeah. or miracle why 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 would you resort always to a miracle if it's got the same probability if not less than a reason for nature yeah, that, and i think yeah. that was kind yeah. of the the um paradigm shift in the way people saw things is in like wait a minute how can we how can yeah. we prove that this is a miracle and how can we prove that it's not nature and if you can prove that it's not nature well then okay yeah it's a miracle but um yeah yeah okay no i I got exactly that same thing note here i got this he was the first to discuss evaluating things that were like more yeah. probable he, in fact sorry it's wrong to probably say he was the first but like he's picked out whom here to be you know one of the, the yeah. shifts into yeah why why resort to explaining things through this idea that a miracle happened it was an act of god when there's more probable yeah. answers um and i think until that was mainly the chapter but i got a few extra things here that i brought in yeah um just because I thought I because he talked about Descartes mm-hmm. later, and I just thought I'd bring it in here, which is like Descartes tried to like reason from first principles. So he tried to break down into like what do I know for sure, right? And this is like he has that famous saying, which is like I think, yeah. therefore I am, or something. And he just talked about this idea of you know how do we know stuff, right? And then he talks about how Descartes basically just broke everything down to like how do I know that I can't know that because I'm I have to think to know that. And then he broke it down to the very only thing he knew for sure was that he was yeah. thinking yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. um and which, uh, uh, which which you know it makes sense in the sense that, like you're trying to find the thing that you can't argue against and then work from there you know um yeah. to try and fill in and, and like the, make things more concrete yeah the classic first principles yeah. approach right because i find what a lot of the philosophy stuff is back to what we're saying then with um human miracles and stuff is like a lot of philosophy is trying to get down to that basic axiom at the very yeah. start. Like, what is the most true or like, what is something that we're going to assume is true and then build upon that to create yeah. a worldview, whether that is, you know, like, well, in fact, we'll talk about it, I think next, but like it talks about Darwin yeah, yeah. and natural selection being like quite a big worldview change. And think about it. If you, and this is where we're at now in the world, which I'm sure is quite interesting for the future because well, at least we're within, within us, what we talk about a lot is we've accepted that Darwin's natural selection yeah. is true. 
And therefore, everything we kind of think and believe is based off the assumption. Like a lot of the stuff we say in this idea of like, you know, things being built into us is built off the assumption that we are apes with genetic material yeah. that, you know, have stuff in us that structure our desires. And therefore, because of that worldview at the center, we can then extrapolate and build yeah. stuff off. Um, and I, I found it quite interesting when I was reading this, just to realize that that's literally what we're doing. You know, if somebody was to go and debunk Darwin, I mean, not, I'm not sure it's possible, but it, like, f- think about it as well. Darwin's thing is actually still a theory and it's a very good expl- explanatory yeah. vehicle of the world and things make sense if you believe it, but there's still there's still a chance that it's not true. Yeah, exactly. All the whole thing's not true. Um, you know, and, go, and, like, and it true. takes, once again, opponents to kind of challenge something and refine it, say what yeah. isn't true and what is true, like what is truth, but, you know. Um, yeah. Y- this is what I mean that like you have to start yeah. somewhere. So this is like kind of the point of how yeah. do we know you have to have something like the bit like Descartes is starting with, you know, I think therefore I am, but like you have to start somewhere with what you believe to then build off it. And and this is why like weirdly a, a bit of a segue, but I think people have to fuck up through history in order for us to realize that they fucked up. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? As in like, you okay, have to yeah, be fine, able yeah. to go like, that wasn't right. This is how it should have been. And then if that thing's not the okay, solution, yeah. then someone goes, well, that wasn't the solution. This is the solution, you know, and it's constantly yeah. being refined and you're constantly throughout history acquiring, um, I don't know, better ways to handle it or better ways to act. And that kind of touches on. A yeah, well, kind yeah. Of Hegel, but, but I, that's, that's really, yeah, I was going to say it does touch on Hegel, which I don't particularly like his whole oh, really? thing. I think it's oh, bullshit. Funny. I think this idea of like, we're going towards this, you know ideal that the, you know the whole mistakes of history are leading us to this one big ideal yeah. i don't believe that i don't know why i just can't it's just well, 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 we'll, just we'll touch on that in a bit as well okay Otherwise, fine um yeah. yeah i try to think if there's anything else from I this think... section i did i did r- r- write or copy across a note from the mm-hmm. knowledge book and it was quite an interesting idea it was this idea that let's just say you're driving through a countryside and there's loads of barns but it happens to be the fake barn countryside yeah. of which one is real <laughs> And you go past a load of barns and you think you know that they're all barns, but only one of them yeah. is the real barn. Like, is that, are you wrong? And it was just like this complete mindfuck. I remember doing it. It talks about this idea of like, um, with knowing things, you have to have a, something like a reliable mechanism for identifying yeah. and knowing something. So like, you know, realistically a barn in your head, is just the concept of mm. the building. A prototype really, basically. Right. And the real, the, and a reliable mechanism usually is your sight and looking at it going, that's a barn because who the hell builds a fake <laughs> barn, you know, you know, world. But this is quite, it's just quite an interesting idea. Like when we perceive things, we almost like verify. It's a bit like that. It would be like, okay, I see the thing that looks like a barn. I'm just going to assume it's a barn because it's not worth me thinking about it not being a yeah. barn. And because, yeah, like I said, who the hell builds fake <laughs> barn barns just to fuck with me. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's we, I think one of the things that, I got from it as well as like, how do you know? You don't yeah. know ever for certain. You just have reliable <clears throat> mechanisms for trying to understand things that, you know, fit the bill and are able you to like yeah. ignore it. Cause also that's just not something that's relevant yeah. to you. Like these barns, but it's something you just look at and go, okay, I, I know what that is. I've seen but, it before. Bang. I'll, I'll partition it away. Like we know, we kind yeah. of know it, but we don't know exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. We know um, a bit like the argument that, you know, you walk through life and you don't never know that the floor is not going to suddenly just yeah. turn to lava and you're going to but I guess you because you never I guess you could it. kind of apply this to shattered assumptions in a sense that like you know you have to yeah. have these assumptions and able to fill in the gaps you have oh, to, to have obviously a hope, in a sense too much information but no but it's just too yeah, much exactly. information you have to have these like if you it's a bit like um I, I think I sent you to you ages ago the frame control problem yeah, yeah. in AI and it's this idea that this simple problem of going to the to a fridge Getting and a sandwich, you know, picking out yeah is impossible because you have to code every single line of saying like don't pick this yeah. don't pick that don't pick so this so you have a heuristic this, instead this, this, or, or yeah you kind of have a heuristic instead you'd be like for example you'd be like okay purple looking meat uh, looks like bread yeah. ham sandwich yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, did, did you get what yeah, I mean yeah. that's kind of how we we think about I mean you structure things in the world like that you know it's this idea that you know you walk to the fridge like I'm hungry right yeah. I'm gonna walk to the fridge it's a bit like what we're saying with the Rome stuff you break things down into manageable chunks because actually the real enemy of reality or for, your, for yourself is just figure out what information to actually well, well this is use. it and I think you know if you if you consider philosophy 
or different philosophies as different ways of thinking, then I guess you mm-hmm. could, yeah, which which they they are. Are, then I guess you could argue that they're basically different kinds of assumptions, you know, as in like if yeah, assumptions yeah. fill in the but gaps have... and those gaps are part of a philosophical thought or framework, then maybe, yeah. you know, well, there's plenty of these like philosophical narr- like I- ideas in the sense or like assumptions which Bill get built upon. I mean, we we spoke about the myth mm. of mental illness on this podcast before. Like that is also a philosophical assumption that the the biology correlates to the you know the the like the illness of the brain is exactly the same as the illness well, this, of the body. Uh, yeah, I was, yeah, and that's an, that's an assu- that's an assumption there. That's a philosophical roughly yeah. assumption that we've used to then build upon a body of knowledge. And it, it's, it, I just find it, yeah, it, this whole ways of thinking as well. So we, let's just move on yeah. to the next one as well, yeah. because I think yeah, this actually almost illustrates the idea as well. So what am I? And I thought this yeah. one was quite interesting because this idea that, so there's a, there's a different schools of like philosophical thought here, right? And the most obvious one that people always just go to is the, the idea that you as a person exist because it mm. feels like you exist. You wake up every day, you have the same rough like consciousness or whatever you want to call it that, basically reminds you of your history and reminds you that you, you know, you inhabit a body on this planet. Therefore it would be safe to assume you are an individual self or just you, you yourself are an individual or whatever. And then there's this idea in like Buddhist thought, which is the self doesn't exist and it's an illusion. And I really like the metaphor he used in this. And that is the chariot. And he's like, he's like, is a wheel a chariot? And it's like, no, is the axle a chariot? And he's like, no, but but the chariot itself is like yeah, an abstraction yeah, yeah. of the whole. So you are you are the abstraction of the, the whole parts. is more than the so, sum, sum and, of its parts, basically. Yeah, and they and they tried to use this. I don't know if you sort of uh, it was like the there's five constituents of yourself, and it's something like to do with your sensory input, yeah. or you know memories. And basically, what it's saying is your yourself, the idea of you as an individual, is an abstraction or a, a generalization yeah. of the parts. But then the question is, where do you stop with the parts? Because then you can keep going down to like exactly, atoms or whatever. Exactly. But anyway, so everything is roughly uh, like an abstraction, right? And this is this actually leads into the reason why things people believe the are uh, in idealism because you know everything's just an abstraction yeah. for something else. Therefore, all you is is just idea after idea after idea, just building up. Um, but yeah, I thought in the yeah, what are we? It's quite interesting uh, this idea of what the juxtaposition of the, the West in general definitely believe in the individual and the self and the, the soul being the core of a human yeah. human right. Like Christianity is predicated that we all have a soul, yeah, almost. And then you've got the opposite side, which is sort of the Eastern traditions of like Buddhism, where there isn't a self, and the whole point of like philosophy and religion is to remove these barriers that trick you into thinking you're isolated from yeah. everything. But this is, but sorry, this is linking back to what we were just saying, right? About this idea of the assumptions, right, and worldviews. So if you believe that the self exists, then you're more likely to defend it and be egotistical. Or if you're somebody who believes that the self doesn't exist, because you know there's plenty of proof. I mean, the proofs in the pudding, and just like describing yourself, yeah. like, what are you? You're a loose collection of behaviors. Yeah, really. Like, so I mean, if you try to define yourself, people come up with loads of little words for it. I'm a bit like this, I'm a bit like this. But you're just cherry picking moments well, when you're well, like also- that. So me saying I'm a I'm a calm person, but then also other times I'm bloody yeah. angry. So well, also think I? about it. Okay, so like, uh-huh. like I, I really liked when they were talking about the five aggregates um, that construct a person, so to speak. So uh, yeah. what is it? I uh, can't remember what they were. Perception, <laughs> mental formation, consciousness, and feeling. I oh, you got think, it. And material form. You and, got it. Uh, cool. What what yeah. I like is what you just said. For instance, is where do you stop when like there's so many yeah. different parts to you. And if you also consider a part as um, an experience, then every okay. experience is slightly changing the whole, the abstraction, right? So it's like if okay, I added yeah. a sixth aggregate, let's say, then the then the self would be different, wouldn't it? A whole would be different. Yeah. And I think that's kind of interesting that as you go through life, in a sense, all of your experiences are catalogued, you know, or they're logged, basically. Yeah. And so the abstraction of everything of you is slightly different now you know if if you're yeah. in a car crash that's a new experience and now you're slightly different you know you're also a survivor or yeah. like this you know and it's i, okay. I find that Fine. quite interesting yeah, yeah. that like you know you're constantly also quite interesting that every- there's, there's never just yeah but everybody else also sees you as the abstraction yeah. they have of you so people see you as the abstraction they have of you and you obviously see yourself you could say more realistically yeah. but you don't 
really, because there is no real version of you. And it's that's, the, that's fluid, the hardest and part it's of changing all this. depending and on any context, this, isn't it? This is almost the ultimate philosophy to not give a fuck. <laughs> it's like, well, everybody else has an abstraction of me, which isn't true. I have an abstraction of me, which also isn't true. So nobody knows who I am. I don't know who I am. Let's just yeah. fucking go yeah, for yeah. it. Because yeah. there's no, there's, yeah. It just, if you really think about it, there is like, yeah. I mean, fair enough. You can say there's some truth to certain things, but then that's, yeah, I guess there is some level of truth, but at the same time, you can change what you just said. Let's just say you're somebody who's really, I don't know, confident or whatever, and then something happens which completely yeah. change your experience. Are you still yeah, that confident yeah. person? No. So the abstraction is now wrong. So then you have to update yeah. it, and then but then you could also become confident again. So like, yeah. <laughs> just it's it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's kind of nuts. I like what you just said there with like you know people abs- have an abstract version of you. So depending yeah, on what possibly. they know about you, they abstract and they like, oh, yeah. this is yours. Yeah. And this is why people like to use specific terms for themselves, like, you know, or use symbols to yeah. impress people because they can't know the whole you. So what do you do? You buy expensive luxury symbols to showcase you're yeah. worth something or you 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 act in certain ways to showcase, you know, your you value certain or, things. About example, others, yeah. yeah. Or you set up a business like me just to say you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but, do you know, but do you know what I mean? It's the same yeah. thing. It's like you, you you have an people have an idea of me also but not just because i have a business or because i do a podcast or because i went to this school or because i had this upbringing they will you you know they'll amalgamate all the things and then come up with this concept of me no, which <laughs> isn't me yeah <laughs> <laughs> and they would not be wrong um but you, yeah, you kind of yeah, get what i mean it's because I, because I, you are yep. those things or whatever that they are but then those things mean different exactly. things to different people exactly like just because you have a business doesn't mean you're yeah. you're good at it. <laughs> just because you do this doesn't mean you're good at it. Just because you just because you have this thing doesn't mean yeah. you're a good person. Or just because you know what I mean. There's all these things that we use, and that's the thing. I I quite like this idea. You know, we use symbols and signals because life's too complicated to analyze everything. So we have to generalize yeah. people yeah. because otherwise, if I didn't generalize you, you'd be way too bloody complicated for me to even fathom because I can't even yeah. fathom myself. So but that's what I like. Like is this this idea of the self is never static mm. it's changing depending on who's who's viewing it well, what uh, what context you know what yeah. that person is and their yeah. experiences i'm probably completely butchering this and i don't know but i would i would have a hunch and a theory that the east probably has less suicide rates especially people who subscribe to buddhism than people who would subscribe to you know um individualism mm. i would i would put money on that that you know if you believe in the self you are more likely to ki- commit suicide than somebody you, who believes in yeah. no self, because I think you just can get attached to specific things. Because the whole point of the the Eastern tradition is to withdraw attachments, right? So if anybody's, with, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to say that suicide is caused by attachments, but it also can be caused by attachment yeah. to ideals. It's like I'm attached to yeah. looking like this. I'm attached to living up to what society because thinks. you hold on, to, you think that this sense of self is static. You know, this is yeah. the only way that I can describe myself and that it doesn't change. And so you hold mm-hmm. on to Oh, that. this is the only exactly. way I want to yeah. be seen as. Like, you you, you, you subscribe yourself to an ideal or like a body type or, a, you know, like a, a, mm. like a concept such as a successful businessman or you, you attach yourself to it and then you judge yourself through that. And there's obviously going to be people who are the top yeah. of the hierarchy for that and who are better than you in every single way because that's just the nature exactly. of reality. Unless, of course, you're somebody like Ronaldo who likes to score yeah. goals for fun and it's like the best football that's ever lived. But, you know, apart from that, you, you're not you're, you're yeah. not there. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, mate, let's move on because I'm really conscious of your 2.30. Oh, I'll push it to 2.45, um, but yeah. Um, um, so... After the so what am I? Themes. Oh, we got some themes. I took in a few. I didn't yeah. take all of them. So I got the first one, so ethical con- consequentialism, which I thought was interesting in itself. So that is, to summarize it, it's basically where ethics can be decided by the consequence of doing the thing. So, you know, if you, if something happened and then the result was bad, like lo- loads of people died, therefore it was the yeah. wrong thing to do. But the problem is then, the problem with ethical uh, consequentialism is you can, time span it up to a hundred you can time span it to a million so all of a sudden okay i act like this today but you know in in 100 years i'm dead so does that mean it was a bad action yeah Yeah. (laughs) it's just like it's it's one of those things that where do you put up the um, parameters to stop to stop it and then this is also half the reason why you get people justifying you know the worst things like oh yeah because we're fighting for the ideal you know we're going to give everybody everything to an end life's going to be you yeah, you know, and then it's just like, yeah, any means to an end. I can do anything because the yeah. end is this. And then they realize that yeah. end never comes. 
because that end is yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, it doesn't work that way. Um, but I thought it was quite interesting because I definitely heard that term consequentialism um, mentioned in Gad Sands yeah, from the parasitic yeah, mind yeah. and this idea that we become consequentialists, such as like, you know, the PC movement. So if you are upset because I've said something, that was the consequence. Therefore, I'm a bad person. Whereas it should be yeah. judged on intent. If I said it, if I said something like, you know, just because I don't care what I'm saying because I'm just chatting to yeah. a friend right now and somebody took offense of it, am I, yeah, 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 doing, yeah. Am yeah. I being bad? Is is the where's it's the, the line? Uh, yeah, it's the argument. Um, it was like, for instance, is something racist if the person didn't mean to, for it to be racist? Yeah, you know. Yeah, because um, it's surely it, yeah. or, or weirdly in like evil. If evil is in the eye of the beholder um, of the victim, then you could say that like I don't know. It's kind of interesting that like someone's of course. Well, everybody victimization yeah. it is in the eyes of the victims. Yeah, when they're victimized, then they can make you out to be. You know, the, the result was yeah. bad for them because they were victimized. Therefore, you're the. This is why um, I think the law. Well, there's an argument for why the law exists. I've actually got the philosophy of law in yeah. front of me, which I'm going to read at some point. But yeah. this idea that, you know, you need the. I think Peterson said it as well in one of his things, which was, um, you know, the fact. The, the default state of humans is if somebody's done something bad and, you know, you're, you're doing the sort of witch hunt after the person who's committed the bad crime, there's no such thing as a jury. You're just you're you know hung, drawn, and quartered, slash yeah, yeah, beaten up yeah. to a pulp based on collective belief of whatever. And if you uh, there's a book called The Wanting One about mimesis, and it talks about the scapegoat. And it's like once somebody is blamed for something, it's very hard back to like you know when you extract something out of the situation. Once somebody's labelled as a kitty fiddler, even if the claims are false, it's yeah. very hard to yeah. remove those claims. And without law and due sort of due process, you will just get people running around, you know, mobbing well, people yeah, yeah. essentially. And I do believe, Jenny, that is the default state. I mean, look at football who Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it, a perfect example is yeah. that guy who, what is it, the Joanna Yates murder. Remember the guy was accused yeah. of murdering her? Who lived around the Oh, couple, yeah, the like, Clifton College guy, wasn't it? Yeah. And then, uh, like, the media blasted that all over the place. And then, turned out he was in the Trial by media, yeah. Um, but, you know, how do you come back from that? Like, <laughs> You don't. You literally don't. Like, well, like, you know, a lot of you is probably relatively yeah. fringe friends i'm sure close friends will stay in contact but like fringe friends would probably just yeah, be like yeah, no yeah. i don't yeah. want to be associated with you because once again it's like, like about your reputation and your reputation gets tainted yeah. it's like why people don't want to move into a Re- house that's had a murder well, or you know oh yes we i just realized we need to move that new book the status one because it's because i was thinking about it status is almost more of a currency than um mm. actual money in my head like, like being respected is almost something we want more yeah. than money i think because money is actually a uh uh what means for status a, a yeah. proxy for status, yeah. Um, which is yeah. But yeah, we'll move we'll move on to the next. We're gonna rattle through. I got there was some others, but I, I kind of ignored a few. So if you got I've gone to evidence and rationality. Yeah, yeah, let's touch on that. But there was one in between, there's one in between. Um basically from this it talks about this idea that, you know, most most of our beliefs um we couldn't get on our lives without yet we you know, if somebody pressed you for why you believe it, you'd be very hard yeah. to find an answer for. Um, like I said it earlier, like the floor won't collapse next yeah. time you take a step. But just because, but it's interesting, I guess, with that one in particular, you can have a couple, you can come up with reasons now, like oh, the floor is made out of atoms, therefore I'm not going to yeah. fall through because I'm material based. Well, like, organism. yeah, I, I think like um, one of his points in this was that you know, like you just said, when people are pressed about why they have a belief, they look for a yeah. reason, and that reason is yeah, based like, on a truth, and that truth is almost based yeah. on whether they've experienced or not experience it uh, yeah and also based on emotional connection yeah. to something so for example like if somebody said to you why is killing wrong you'd be like oh, it just is wrong and why is because you have this like emotional baggage associated with yeah. killing well some people yeah. don't right but the majority of people do and they you know you have that feeling of like is that's what that's what they sort of say where it's like passions yeah. before reason because it is it's like the reason comes after that feeling of like, that's not right. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's hard to, and how do you explain that? You just feel like it's not yeah, right. And it's, it's funny how much like, you know, our emotions dictate our behavior and our beliefs, you know? It's, it's, it's back to the, the split brain thing. If you can't make decisions about emotion, then you're, you're going to die. So emotions have evolved to, I, I think, yeah, the well, emotions have evolved to make you take action and make you to decide things and to, to believe things, yeah. I guess also, you know? It's a bit like why does PTSD happen? It's this idea that your emotions are trying to gauge a system to avoid that scenario that you once experienced, but you're getting the wrong stimuli, which is setting off that yeah. that feeling, yeah. and you're just trapped in that spiral. But essentially, it's your emotions trying to guide you from that 
horrible experience exactly. again. Um, what else do I get from this bit? The other themes were the self, but we already spoke, yeah. spoke about that. So like the bundle theory viewed as separation. Oh, another one, separation of mind from self. Like, is your mind different? Mind over matter? Is is your mind, does it does it exist separately from physical Yeah, I, I found these um, like, quite hard, as in like they're very similar to just empiricism and rationalism. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, it may, it's like once again, it's all like, yeah, it's yeah, all interlinked yeah. to those sort of three main yeah. questions, right? And then, in fact, we can just jump on this one quickly. So, um, we got the his- philosophy mm-hmm. from a historical context. So I got, you know, you can't really extract philosophy from their context yeah. when they were said, because obviously a lot of the philosophy in the day and age was based off what they believed. And obviously now you got philosophies probably being built upon the Darwinian yeah. framework, because that's yeah. what everybody sort of takes as the base assumption these days, uh, which is interesting in itself. But um, this idea that you can't, you know, when somebody believes something in that time, it was because of, all the information and beliefs yeah. they had available to them at the time. That's why um, the whole importance of kind of epistemology, because you're kind of almost trying to track someone's thought process and why they yeah, thought that the historical yeah. context needs to be taken into consideration about what they mean. Yeah, for sure. And also what's the base yeah. assumption? Because I think they were talking about how what's like, the, what's the core? Athens was at war with Sparta when like so- uh, Plato was writing his stuff. And, um, oh God, was it? Oh, I can't remember who was it. Was it Descartes? No, when there was like the Spanish Armada, I can't remember who was saying. But yeah, they, these all need to, these are all things that need to be taken into consideration. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would say the usual stuff we say about not judging people through the morals of today from the past because it just doesn't yeah, make sense because the morals are different. But it doesn't need you to can say. try and abstract um, points and then apply them now. That's basically what philosophy is today. Yeah. You know, taking on all these philosophies and then trying to see how they work today and whether they mismatch well yeah match um well it's quite interesting to see. yeah so then i got obisms i mean unless you were did you find anything else on that some themes there was like per- political contract or something the social contract which i didn't particularly find enlightening or you know anything that yeah was no he touches more about that um, later on um i think yeah with um so was, we'll but go yeah let's we'll go quickly into yeah. the isms then so bits like we said so there's materialism idealism which is the realm of mm-hmm. metaphysics and that's the idea that you know too bad i like this book particularly because it just had such not so i guess succinct descriptions yeah. of what they were because beforehand i kind of roughly knew but this kind of really made, made it general helpful. and usable which is like materialism is the belief that at the core the world is made out of matter and then idealism is at the core the world is made out of ideas so this is back to this idea that you know technically the concept of matter is an idea in our heads that explains phenomena we see so therefore is it real is it actually matter or is it something we've constructed and that's where you get the debate around which is which um especially as you know um well the idea thing is mainly based in fact the idea thing i i'm coming more and more round to it but I still am not 100% where I stand. I think there's going to be an amalgamation well, yeah, of the two. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot I don't of know where these you stand are, because, you know, I also tell yeah. that, like, brought in... Yeah, as I say, it depends which elements and, you look at, and, right? There's elements... And what happens when you look at it like as well. Like, it, it touches a lot on yeah. Jordan Peterson's point of, like, when you see a table, you see your utility of it. You know, when you see a bottle, you yeah, don't yeah. just see a bottle and that's it. You see a bottle that you drink and that you're going to drink. You know, or if you're trying and, and to save also, yourself yeah. and use it as a weapon... You know, and interestingly as well, you you uh, ignore stuff which isn't mm. usable. So, for example, let's say we were in a forest and we had always lived in a forest and we knew which plants to eat. We'd be very good at searching out the plants to eat and we'd know exactly. Like you'd, yeah. I would walk around a, pro- a forest yeah. with way more appreciation knowing I can eat that, I can't eat that. That's that, that's tasty, that's not tasty. But the, because we got all our food packaged in the supermarket, I don't go through a forest and go, wow, what's what's usable here? Um, yeah, yeah. you get me and we do perceive everything is usable like after this call i'm like right okay well let's just think i need a wee i'm gonna yeah. use the toilet we just perceive actions and things to do yeah. help us do actions always well, because it's basically like an egocentric point of view it's like how does this help me what but yeah and that's yeah, yeah. no but that's, i think that's his point against like you know how should we act is it's hard to do scientifically because it's not Science will tell you what exists, but it won't tell yeah. you what to do with and what exists. And it's completely exists. subjective and relative um, in a sense. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we got empiricism, rationalism, which I have always struggled to get my head around. But I kind of I yeah, I kind of got it. it rationalism. Yeah, I'll explain how I see yeah, it, yeah. and you tell me how you see it. I I got the idea that rationalism is more like pure thought and 
logic and it doesn't you don't need to experience something mm. to explain it or and then whereas empiricism is more like you observe and then based off observation you create theories yeah. around yeah. it kind of, i think that's the best way yeah, to explain no, that's, it. that's pretty much how um, i had it like basically that empiricism is basically like perception you know and rationalism yeah. is thought and reason and it's just yeah. what i find interesting is that like i guess i have kind of a more scientific background in the sense that for me it has to be both you can't you can't look yeah. at something and well, not have yeah. thought about it and you can't think about something and yeah. not look at it you know it's like yeah walking well, first this is it. like i thought, literally made, like, yes. made a note of like chicken and the egg because like when a baby is yeah. born you know they might have certain ingrained genetic thoughts let's say but then like they see yeah. the world and then that yeah. it's constantly constructivism in a sense um they're yeah there's no perception free yeah. knowledge right like i mean even the idea of numbers comes through the sense of there yeah. being a unit exactly and then another unit and that that comes from yeah. their senses so like we've we've literally created mathematics and the idea yeah. of counting from the fact that we can see things which we can then be like that is one of these things that is two of these things and you can abstract obviously yeah, exactly there's more um, which you wouldn't have got through free thought because you would have nothing yeah. to structure it on. Um, but yeah, and then I think the, the last one was relativism, which is, you know, what I've touched on recently. I still can't get my head around it because I get it. It is the, I get why it mm -hmm. exists because everything is relative yeah. to something else. Like relative, like relatively, everything is relative yeah. to something else. But like, you know, the way we perceive is based on like comparison, almost good and bad, <laughs> right or wrong. I mean, even even the colors, I guess, are like a spectrum. Yeah, yeah, to a degree. yeah. Obviously, there's more variation. Like everything, like that color to compare to that color is relative. And if you actually look, remember that book, um, that, uh, Other mm -hmm. Minds yeah, is yeah. about the octopuses? And it tried to build up a theory of perception based off the very first ability to perceive is a cell that detects that this pH next to it has changed and adapts or like it compares the pH from yeah, a yeah. second ago to the, the pH that was there then. And then it goes, okay, the pH change, I've got to move. And therefore, perception in its most infant stage or sensor, sensory or like sensory behavior was based off comparison yeah. to something. And therefore, everything's based on comparison. And this whole idea of like, it just doesn't answer well, anything. I, this is the point he makes is like, you can be relative about anything, but it doesn't tell you how to. Well, yeah, I think like, you know, what we've talked about in terms of abstract concepts um, a couple of times in the sense that like, I see it as a sphere and you, you need to look at it from all different angles. And I guess the idea of relativism is like not to look at something in just one perspective, but to look at it in many, yeah, of course, yeah. in order to try and like, you know, see the whole sphere in a sense, um, because everything changes depending on what you're comparing it to. Um, yeah. But then, but then like, this is the point. So like, you know, if you did the relativist argument the whole time, you would never well, have yeah, an answer exactly, to anything. Exactly. It's almost like a byproduct yeah, yeah, of the yeah. skepticism where you can't know anything for sure, therefore you yeah. can't even act. So therefore you're going to be like, like a donkey which has you know water over there and some food over there. Which yeah. one do you go for? You go like this for like 10,000 years and you die. I think they've got a you short know, lifespan in that, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to add that. Um, but yeah, um, no, exactly. But you, you get the point, right? You, you can't yeah. make decisions based off infinite comparisons. So you almost, this is like almost the reason for the emotion and the... Uh, and you know value hierarchies it's like you know all of a sudden you you have two choices you've got to value something yeah. more than the other so you just switch the one that's most relevant but it is it, it, it's interesting like, like you know take eat uh, take the book evil for example you know looking at it from the perspective of both people completely changes like you know what's what's relative to to the individual and you know and that's um, it it's like com yeah it's yeah everything's relative because nothing exactly. happens twice so everything's relative to that it's um yeah yeah so anyway that's that's that bit and then we got on to the next chapter so this is the last one i have i didn't bother mm -hmm. the freedom of the will and the other, so i got more some more high spots so yeah <laughs> we've we've got descartes so we talked about that there like i think therefore i yeah. am and then we've got hegel so mm, i i love i love this idea it's so wacky it's just so complicated but like basically the idea that nature or the tries to understand itself in a sense through embodying okay. a host, which is an individual, which is a human being. So basically yeah. the only way you can understand yourself is by 
expressing yourself to others and so like interacting with others or make it like creating you know writing or creating any kind of uh, thing that you can see yourself in so the whole idea is to create okay. something that can understand itself right so yeah, the way that i would like analogous to this is that it's weird that we are now understanding the big bang the big bang that created us okay. and we're now understanding that right so hegel's idea is okay. kind of like this ever evolving idea of trying to understand nature is basically in the heads okay. of like every um individual and it doesn't matter like the individual okay. will die but then it will you know someone else will be taking it on and it's constantly growing Got through experience kind of it's really trippy and really hard to try and explain um yeah no no i i got that i i've yeah it was always a constant conflict wasn't it between but didn't you see something along the lines of it i mean i know marx was the conflict between the rich mm. and poor was like the ultimate like manifestation of like nature trying to get to his ideal state or something but the hegel stuff i yeah, don't think there is an I ideal state really... i don't think you will ever be able to understand like it, you know we're constantly trying to do this in the sense that take freud for example right you've got your consciousness yeah. your pre-conscious and then your unconscious and basically the whole yeah. idea of psychology and a lot of sciences is to try and unveil some of the unconscious so that you understand the whole right like that's basically it we're conscious yeah. of what we know and we're trying to understand more about our unconscious it's kind of the same concept yeah. in, a, in a sense that like you know you can't do that by just thinking about introspectively because you only know what you know i do yeah. like the idea um i know i don't get it wrong i do like it i just uh it's very hard to get your head i try i just no, it is, and I, there's more nuance to it than just that. He has he has his own idea of how things are meant yeah. to plan out. I'm pretty sure he has some level of like that. There, you know, I'm pretty sure part of his philosophy did lead to stuff like Hitler as well. But I can't remember exactly why it was linked. And there's something to do with. But um, so it's just also interesting that the abstraction of Hitler also puts people off yeah. stuff, doesn't it? It's yeah. really interesting. Um, but yeah, so uh, too bad. I'm gonna have to. I would have to read more of him because I know apparently as well he's really yes, hard to read. What, yeah, it's not even just. Yeah, he was saying he's just like you got to bear have yeah. patience. Um, and then only a few other things I got here. So we got the Darwin bit, which is like I kind of touched on it earlier that the idea of natural yeah. selection in general has led to sort of like new ideas of philosophy because if the base assumption is that we are just apes rather than you know below so we're not even just below gods we're like literally yeah. on the same level with animals apart from we have a bigger brain we therefore you know our place in the universe has changed therefore we i guess are more humble and therefore we can and also with stuff like the big bang and stuff we realize that there are non god yeah. explanations yeah. for things and therefore the new philosophy is what do we do with this new knowledge and then there's also the argument to be had that now we believe we are gods because we've discovered things which you know yeah, destroy yeah. things and we've we've become so such masters of our environments as a collective that we've become yeah. godlike um i don't know if you have anything to add to that yeah just uh, yeah um, like uh, he, i just found it interesting to kind of link with hegel and this because the idea that you know if you're trying to understand yourself Darwinism is kind of like, well, now you've got genes and you're taking that into consideration with natural selection. So it's like almost almost like nature having a method of trying to find the best genes for the current environment, if you get what I mean. You know, it's like we're tested yeah. uh, trial and error constantly. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I guess interesting as well, the Darwin sort of approach has led to a lot of other philosophies off the mm. back of it, right? With the survival of the fittest. Yeah, almost, through what was it, well, Spencer, you put of, that forward. And then... So like, what's it, neo, what's it called? Dar so, social mm. Darwinism? Yeah. Where it's like, you know, trying to use Darwin's ideas to explain inequality and all sorts of things. Mm. Like, Which in itself like, creates like a like hierarchy a, and says that aristocracy yeah, is better. Yeah. Than, you know, all these people are weak yeah. and these people are strong. And that's what kind of led to also eugenics and all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this this is another way it's philosophy impacts, you know, just from like because if you take these ideas as mm. core and then life becomes all a big competition, yeah. then it also justifies capitalism and it justifies. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm not particularly against capitalism. I'm, I'm against rigged yeah. capitalism, uh, and also I think it just leads to more egotistical approaches to life because everybody believes everything's survival and competition. Yeah. Therefore, everything is a competition to like signal and show off to people, and you know. It's the, the losers. But the then lose. it's interesting I mean, when. Thing is, it, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, no. I was going to say, like the thing is, it 
you can argue it's always been like that, but the the philosophy of like God and equal and all having a soul allowed us to be all on a level mm. playing field. Whereas if you then do take now this idea of there is superiority based on genetics and based on, you know, if you look across the animal kingdom, like the alphas take over in a group or whatever, then all of a sudden you've got the justification yeah. needed, which is all humans need because the devil is rationalism to, to behave in well, bad I, ways I, I, or to, to be so more. I smoking. think it's interesting because you end up having, it comes back to the idea that, you know, you're either selfish or, 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 you know, you have two, two realms. You've got um, being selfish and being like a collective and they're always yeah. going to exist. And these different kind of ways of thinking and acting come around to either emphasize one or the other, you know? And so biology, yeah. like biology uh, may emphasize a bit of sel- um, selfishness, but it also um, emphasizes collectiveness. But then you end up having capitalism and the economy that end up kind of emphasizing a bit more of the selfish. But that's why you used to have religion that emphasized the collective, right? And so now at the moment, you could argue yeah. that, well, okay, because everything is so consumerist and based on capitalism and the economy, um, that uh, selfishness has been emphasized loads. And because of the erosion of the church and religion, you don't have as many like morals but are, like guiding the way. And that's why I think it kind of leads into Marxism, because he said that basically, you know, this is all to do with like the economy is the catalyst for power and for selfishness and, and mm. um, violence and oppression. Um, Basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, and then Nietzsche talks a lot about that as well. Doesn't he? he... Yeah. I, I, Nietzsche is quite interesting. I don't particularly agree. No, with he's, he's quite, I thought he, he, has a, he does have that classic ref, refreshing taste yeah. on things where he basically says, I think one of his main theses is good and evil, like moral favor, or like the morality is set yeah. by the elites to favor yeah. themselves. And then he saw this idea of Christianity as actually um, slave, what's it called? Like slave virtue, where it's this idea of virtue being, um, virtue being a sufferer. So like you're virtuous if you know, you suffer things for the sake of it. And he was against that. He was like, you know, it should be, you should be powerful. You should aim to yeah. be powerful, the, the will to be the will to power or something. Yeah. But I also thought it's quite interesting as well. He talked about this idea that, you know, human suffering, people put up with human suffering if there's a reason yeah. for it. But then there's also the caveat to that, which is when they can blame people for it. And he explains quite a lot with like, you know, the whole, um, what you call it? The Russian Soviet sort of gulag camps is based off this idea that, you know, if they can blame their suffering on other people and then the eradication of them leaves their non-suffering, you can justify yeah. everything. And he almost used, in my head used Christianity as a way or the idea of Christianity or like religion and God looking after you for your suffering is a way of like, like an opiate for the masses to not. Yeah. 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 Cause they, cause it basically put the sole responsibility on yourself to achieve, you know, or to get through your suffering, to get to, but, to heaven. But without that, then people can't justify the suffering and they need to. Well, this is it. And I think, I think what's interesting is, you know, he was saying that, you know, the morals and the values that people hold dearly are normally the opposite of the ones that are winning in their society at the moment. If they don't have those qualities, they will try the opposite and almost reconstruct a value system in their own way. And yeah, it's like counterculture. Exactly. And which is so interesting because you could say today, well, everyone gets accused of being privileged. Right. And so everything that they have should be stripped away, but then that kind of incentivizes and makes a situation possible where people, seek to to be the least privileged as possible and the way you do that yeah. is by emphasizing a victimization of victimology you know and um mm. and then that becomes a hierarchy in itself doesn't it it's like the more victimized yeah. you are the higher up that that ladder you go yeah, well, then, um, yeah. also if you're very victimized you're probably the most resentful ex- exactly. well, sadly. so that's not a very good person to put in power but yeah. um yeah, no, for it's, it, I found, I find, I got to read, I've got it here, the genealogy. Yeah, I, I really want to read that. Dive into at some point. Apologies for the abrupt cut, we unfortunately had to take a break. We tried our best to continue where we left off, however, I just wanted to make you aware in case it seemed like a strange transition. Here's the rest of the podcast. All right, so we had a bit of a break, um, but we're back, and I think we're almost at the end of this book anyway. Um I think what were we talking about last time? To. So I think we were we were talking about yeah. Nietzsche and we we're talking about I think this idea. Well, I think we got past Nietzsche to be honest. We were talking mainly about Nietzsche's sort of um, 
his approach to suffering wasn't we were talking about suffering and then if people have a reason to suffer which you know in the form of like spirituality or belief in yeah. a god and belief in an afterlife then they can you know so the sort of uh, was it i think nisha was a guy quoted saying the the person who has a why can bear any how mm. whatever it is or you know and that's that's the point there whereas now we live in a world where suffering there's no really like real proper meaning reason for, for explaining suffering yeah. yeah so we start blaming other people and he says when that happens it leads to violence yeah. um yeah, I think that's roughly. We but yeah, I guess I guess that's why Jordan Peterson talks about him a lot because obviously Jordan Peterson promotes and emphasizes like self growth. But in order to grow, you have to suffer in a sense, as in like you know you have to go through the chaos. Um, yeah. But there's a bigger meaning to it. There's a reason for it because you're going to acquire this this growth in a sense. Um, yeah, and then and then if the, yeah, then if the, you can you know put your suffering towards another human being though that's when it gets a bit like back mm. to the evil thing if if this person is stopping you he's yeah. the opposition he's yeah. the adversary therefore you know it, it incites violence almost yeah well it, it depends if you um, like you know what the reason is that you're suffering for it's like or well, you're yeah. creating suffering um it's quite interesting as well because this reminds me a bit of the buddha stuff like you know if you realize that you know, there isn't really a self and well, I don't know, or the whole, they believe that attachments to things are the cause of mm. suffering. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, somebody's beating you with a stick. That's not really, <laughs> <laughs> it's not because you don't, like, that's not because you have a self yeah. that, that hurts, but there is certain areas where, you know, a bit like earlier on, I think, I, I, what was the book? I remember it was something, it was like a Buddhist book. It was that, the guy Naval Ravikant really likes, but kind of, oh something. yeah i know the one you're talking and about he said yeah. something i remember in one of his books he said something along the lines of like the only reason you ever get upset when somebody like calls you a name about something is because you entertain the notion that it's mm. true so like you know the things that hurt people the most are usually the things that cut cut deep cut yeah. closest to cut closest yeah. to the truth about what you are or whatever if somebody's saying something to you as an insult if if you completely don't believe that's what you are it just yeah. goes over your head but if you can see an element of the truth in it that's when it uh hurts yeah. the most um yeah i didn't know how that was linked but yeah a okay. little, um, little gem there for you um yeah i would like to read into him uh, to be fair all of these like philosophers that he mentions throughout this book sound really interesting it's just quite daunting isn't it it's like you properly have to strap yourself in for the ride because it's just taking you along this journey that you've never even contemplated in a sense or maybe you have but like briefly you know yeah. it's such a different way of thinking and it's kind of jarring because you're like oh i don't i don't think that but then kind of the more you read the more reasonable it sounds in a sense you know yeah. it's like yeah, oh yeah. okay i can understand how someone might think that um you may not agree yeah. but yeah um i think bertrand russell said something like that as well like you know people do have their reasons for things even if you can't yeah. understand it and it's your job to try and understand how they've come to those conclusions but that's the epistemology isn't it um yeah everybody i mean that even reminds you of the how the crucial conversations it was like you know you got to understand somebody's yeah. epistemology before you can you know criticize it and then you, you don't even criticize it you just make them doubt it right i mean that's the whole well if, if you approach to if you try to understand someone's current point you're judging from your perspective but if you go from their current point and then you try and track back you can kind of see the trajectory that they're going in you know um well, and you can see yeah, and where they've come they from. Came to that yeah, conclusion. exactly. Yeah, um, yeah, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, I think there's what is it? Just one more chapter? Or, or there two? was. I didn't write any notes down for freedom of will. So there was two. So the the last one was something like why do philosophy mm-hmm. or something, and it talked about more contemporary stuff, and I completely ignored it. Did you put so much for um, determinism? No, I I'm just I really unsure where I sit on it. Uh, what, what what did you put like, down for it? The way that I kind of tried to understand it is I think basically the idea that if everything has a cause and effect, then everything is basically predictable. If everything is based on like an atom that has a cause and effect, then that can lead it. Like if you were to go further down the line, everything would be predictable because you'd be like, that would hit that and that would hit that and that would hit that in a sense. And so kind of everything is foretold and i think if you apply the physical because that's based on a physical tangible level okay like a materialistic 
perspective, then you could argue that thoughts are also materialistic and they act in the same way. So I thought of that and that led me to this thought and that thought led me to this thought. So I would say the direction. Exactly. Way, like it take you a specific but then way. it's interesting because obviously some philosophers disagree. Um, and because they're, it was kind of interesting. I wrote a note down because they were talking about like consciousness and how, whether by us having consciousness, do we break that deterministic direction as in everything has occurred up until this point, but then we have the ability to make a decision. And then we are the ones that kind of have fate in our own hands in that sense. I would, I would say this definitely. I'm more excited. Yeah. Than same. That. Because I, because I think you, you know, you reflect as well, and like experience changes your way you'll handle the same problem in the future. So it's not like you're determined, and you can also view things mm. in different ways. So by almost shifting your view, you've then got yourself out of the determinism of that last mindset. So it's a bit like, well, it doesn't really, in my head, from experience, it doesn't. Yeah, work. exactly. And I think, I think, I yeah, I think it gives you di- you've got directions, but you're also driven. You can change direction, yeah. right? The whole point of the prefrontal is is mostly inhibitory. And the thing is, is that like, so it stops you from. It doesn't allow you to go anywhere. You're kind of backed into a corner if you say that everything is determined, you know. And I, I think you know some things are and some things aren't, and that's kind of their approach. Because for other philosophies to mingle, you can't hold on so much to this deterministic attitude. Um, that's kind of what. That's kind of what I got for um, determinism, I think. Yeah. No, I mean, that would make make sense. But there's a few good books on that, isn't it? Because otherwise, I'm, yeah. I'm not really well versed in it. I just, I already have my opinion on it. I don't really know if I'm going to be convinced otherwise, to be honest. It just doesn't make I, sense. Otherwise. Yeah. Because I guess you, because what, because what you could then do is everything that happens is then called but, fate because that's. Well, that's this is it. Is. Yeah. It's all determined, so you can't do anything to change it. But then that's just, you know... It's very nihilistic, and I think that's kind of um, oh. Nietzsche's point. Yeah. I think that's probably why he talked about yeah. Nietzsche prior to um, determinism, because, yeah. you know, if everything is determined, then what's the point in doing anything? Because it's already get, it's already yeah. been foretold. Like, personally, I think... I don't know, like, it's such a, a sad topic in a sense, isn't it? Because you're basically saying that you're not in control of doing anything. Well, I think, I think you're, I think you're determined by, you're already determined in the, in the sense of, like, your instincts and your, the structure of what you would desire yeah. to a degree. So I think, you know, we all have similar desires. Obviously, there's a lot of variety in it, but the, the, the core human sort of reproductive stuff based on the Darwinian sort of philosophy, mm. um, reveals that there are some deterministic traits that people have in terms of you know there's like a standard of beauty to a degree roughly there's obviously variation but there is some level of like understanding between people that's predetermined in my opinion like that's not something you have free will over it's been like oh i I have free will so i can just decide now that i like men yeah but but, but Um, this is if that makes sense so there is stuff like there's elements that are predetermined. Well, right? This is it. I think it's a mix of both, isn't it? And that's the only way that's the only way you would, if you think about it back to the chaos and order stuff, that's the only way it would work. Yeah, exactly. No, I think, I think it has to be. I can see your head. What's that? <laughs> She's trying to pull <laughs> um, But it makes sense from a, from a perspective of um, survival and evolution. Right? Yeah. This isn't, you can never program uh, organism to cater yeah. for everything so they have to have some level of structure but then at the same time they have to be open to variation and yeah. change right but exactly you may be like that genetically inclined in a direction but it's only if you actually follow that direction whether it you know um actually manifests itself or not i think you know yeah. it's it's once again a bit of both um and that's what i find so interesting about all of these philosophies especially when there is dualism and there are two like philosophies going on is that some people hold on to them so tightly and it kind of is like you know you i'm pretty uh i'm pretty it's one of those weird things that i actually find it more empowering to be somebody who hasn't yeah. decided because you can see it from every single and maybe you know you pick bits from here and you pick bits from there you know mm. you don't have to like just host- stick to one or the other um so, yeah, it's like, it's, that is technically what the mental model. I think I was thinking about this the other day as well. Mental models are basically mm. the same world, same world, the worldview or you know concept. 
it's the same word as a way of understanding a specific thing based on like you know yeah on a model um and you can have multiple they all explain some things and yeah. explain others so yeah no exactly um so yeah it's kind of interesting i think i think that's to honest for me that's all yeah i, I think the, i think i'm the same actually um I, like, there's one more chapter which is what's in it for whom but it um, didn't really talk yeah, it was talking about it was like the motives of why philosophy why to um, like to go into philosophy and yeah like, yeah and i i think like he touched on um the individual which like you know because we've i think we've talked about stoicism here and there on this podcast um which is a perfect example of like an individual kind of philosophy in a sense yeah that benefits the collective <laughs> um yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah apart from that like i think that's pretty much it so yeah i think that's a wrap well i hope you enjoyed that guys i know it can be quite a lot to take on board but i hope you got the gist like i said the next rome recap will be the philosophy of science so make sure you subscribe so that you know when it's coming up and so that you can build on everything that you've just learned. As for our book summaries, next week we will be summarising Jordan Peterson's second book, 12 More Rules for Life Beyond Order. So make sure you tune in for that because it's going to be a good one. Anyways, until then, stay wise.